What are the similarities between the worlds of art and wine? Does one attract more obsessive natures than the other? And what do these worlds have to teach each other and us? Well, tonight you're going to get those stories and insider tips in our conversation. If you're watching this video on the replay, please get into the comments and type the word replay. Let me know where you're logging in from, what city. Um, I, of course, if you're here with me live during this live stream, um, I want to know where you're logging in from and what's in your glass. I'm Natalie McLean and I teach online wine and food pairing classes and you've just joined one of the most passionate groups of wine lovers who get together every Wednesday at 7 p.m. to talk to the most interesting people in the worlds of wine and in this case art as well. Um, this is uh, this video is a recording for my podcast Unreserved Wine Talk but I'm live streaming it for the first time on social media and I'm going to be here in the comments live so get in there ask questions what are your favorite tips or stories um, what questions haven't we answered? And I'll be responding in real time. Now, before I introduce our fabulous guest, just let me say that three of you are going to win a copy of her terrific new book, Get the Picture. All you have to do is email me at natalie at nataliemcclain.com and let me know that you want to win a copy. I'll choose three people randomly from those who contact me. All right, back to our guest. Bianca Bosker is the author of the New York Times best-selling books, Get the Picture, A Mind-Bending Journey Among the Inspired Artists and Obsessive Art Fiends Who Taught Me How to See, and Cork Dork, A Wine-Fueled uh, Adventure Among the Obsessive Sommeliers, Big Bottle Hunters and Rogue Scientists Who Taught Me How to Live for Taste. A contributing writer to The Atlantic, she has also written for publications such as The New Yorker, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Her, her work has been recognized with awards from the New York Press Club, the Society of Professional Journalists, and others, and has been included in the best American travel writing. And she joins us now from New York City. Welcome, Bianca. It's so great to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, absolutely. And we spoke five years ago for Cork Dork, so I'm really interested in this latest book. And although it's not about wine, we are going to lasso it right back to wine anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> So congratulations on hitting the New York Times bestseller list again with this book. That is amazing and so well-deserved. Um, you're on book tour now. Uh, how many cities have you visited and how many more to go? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> how many have I been to now? I mean, I guess... Ten, a dozen, I'm not sure, but wow. it's been a blast. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Uh, it's you know, I've been everywhere from Portland, Oregon, my hometown, um, where I was at Powell's Books, which I think of as one of my parents, um, you know, <laughs> Houston, Austin, Miami, obviously New York City. Um, I'll be heading to D.C. in a couple weeks. So, um, you know, just kind of keeping the party going as much as possible. Well, let's hope a Canadian city might get added to that tour, given the success of the book. I um, hope so, too. <laughs> please let us know. We'll be there. Um, and aside from writing a great book, which you have, what are the top three things that have, made, that have been you found most effective in marketing this book? Of course, I am asking for a friend. <laughs> um, you know, I think that with book marketing, it's sort of... Um, amazing to me how much it continues to be a little bit of a black box like I have been asking everyone I can get a hold of those say that same question um, and I think that the answer I basically get is like you just have to try everything and do everything um, I mean I can tell you that I am someone who says yes to everything like I just I feel like someone once told me you sell one copy at a time and so like if anyone gives me the opportunity or is interested in hearing um, about the book where I'm doing Yes, like I will be there. I will be at your book club. I will be, um, you know, on your podcast. Like I will, you know, be on your Substack. Like whatever it is, I really um, am so excited about those opportunities and really grateful for them. So, I mean, I will tell you, as you probably know, um, and I think, you know, a lot of people know. Like I've basically emailed everybody that I know about the book. I'm like, <laughs> you have to. Yeah, I want you to know. Yeah. I care. I'm excited. Um, I genuinely believe that you know people's lives will be worse off if they don't read it and uh, and I also feel like a lot of us you know we get daily emails from like I don't know open table or food delivery services like I can send you two emails about a project that's taken years of my life so hopefully, hopefully people aren't too annoyed but that's been sort of my philosophy I uh, agree a hundred percent and how many book clubs have you zoomed into approximately do you know um 
I don't know, but I always try my best, you know, if the schedules okay. permit. Um, I'm supposed to go to one uh, to my neighbors next week. So hmm. there you go. Even <laughs> yeah. neighbors count. Yeah, absolutely. I'm zooming into one tonight. But uh, um, yeah, book clubs are an amazing way. OK, we'll get back to the topic here now that I've had my free consulting moment. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, now, you say that people in the art world um, it's the people in the art world who drew you to this story. Um, and I love how you described one artist as, quote, hissing at the poor quality grommets at a competing gallery uh, that they were using to hang their paintings. It's so telling, just that, even that one word. Obsessive is in the subtitle of both your books. Do you find art world people more obsessive or less than wine world people? Why, why not? Yeah, so um, you're totally right to hop on that through line. I mean, I think, um, as I write in Cork Dork, like, I am someone obsessed with obsession. And I think in both worlds, in the wine world and the art world, you know, there is this just magnetic passion that drew me in. And I think in particular, in both cases, it was this all-consuming passion that people had for something that I did not understand. And something about their obsession nudged me into a place where I really had a sort of identity crisis, where I felt like, you know, I think I might be living my life all wrong. You know, <laughs> art didn't make sense to me, wine didn't make sense to me, um, and that disconnect between what I was observing and my own sort of inability to figure out why these things were such big deals to people really launched me on these journeys to understand these worlds. Um, and so, you know, I think that in, in Art's case, um, you know, Art had been a passion of mine growing up, but by the time I kind of got to be, you know, in my 30s, we were not on speaking terms. It really, I think for most of my adult life, I felt like I didn't know how to do art. Um, and as you said, it was, the art itself was very befuddling to me. And, and even as I tried reconnecting, really left me cold. But it was the intensity of the people within it that intrigued me. You know, I'd never met a group of people willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. And than the art world people. Yeah. So, so are you saying they're more obsessive than the wine world people? I think it's so hard to compare. I mean, it's sort of like you're taking, you know, an Olympic swimmer, an Olympic runner and being like, which huh. is faster? It's like they're, they're both really fast, just a different modes, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I, I just think that both of them have this, um, to me, really magnetic obsession, but it's sort of hard to quantify, like, which is more intense. They're both, yeah. to me, utterly um, fascinating and, and personally, we're all consuming. Now, I know you're not a psychoanalyst, but why do you think <laughs> obsessive natures are drawn to these two worlds? I love that question. I think it's um, a really, really interesting one. I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, perhaps part of it is these are worlds where people are not necessarily, in, in general, like um, in it for the money, <laughs> right? I mean, I think True. there has to be something else that's pulling you through it. I also think these are both worlds where you can go deep. Like there is kind of an endless amount of information that you can learn. I also think that these are worlds that are not purely sort of bloodless intellectual pursuits. They are both in their own way hedonistic, right? They mm. really um, sort of involve all of us. They involve our minds and they involve our bodies. And that was something that took me a while to arrive at with the art world. You know, I think that um, for the last hundred years or so, we've been told that what really matters about an artwork is the idea behind it. Like the thought trumps the thing. And Marcel Duchamp sort of arguably kicked us off on that path when he took who a urinal. Who is he? So artist who took a urinal, was credited with taking a oh. urinal, putting it on a pedestal and telling us that it was art. And he was a big <laughs> proponent for the idea of um, art that tickled the, the mind, but not necessarily the eye. He sort of was dismissive of what he termed retinal art, which was kind of included, you know, the whole band of impressionism. Um, but, you know, I think when we go to a lot of galleries and museums, there's a lot of like hushed murmuring about you know, dead philosophers and um, ideas and dichotomies and liminal this, liminal that. And, and what was so 
fascinating to me and such a breakthrough for me in my relationship with art was actually getting into artist studios and realizing the way that art making is a deeply physical process, right? It mm -hmm. is almost a blood sport in the way that wine is too, right? It's, <laughs> well, you're stretching canvases and I mean, yeah. I was surprised at the athleticism of, yeah. of art. Yeah, totally. And I think for me, it was a lesson in the way that artists look at art and, and um, you know, one artist I worked for, Julie Curtis, as she put it, you know, an idea is not a painting. Painting is constant decision making. And I think working for artists was for me this revolution in the way I saw art, but also in the way I saw the world. And, and part of what it taught me when it came to art was to slow down, to look at the physical form of the work and to examine the, the decisions that an artist makes. Huh. Um, and I think that that can lead us to having a really heady experience. But the experience of looking at art, I think, is really almost like you know, being with another person. You're two bodies in space. And there's a totally different connection that you have when you just let yourself uh, have this physical experience and, and recognize that, like being around people, it's totally different to be um, face to face with an artwork than it is to you know, see it remotely or digitally. On the internet, yeah. yeah. And you say it's a series of decisions, again, because I'm gonna keep bringing it back, but winemaking too is a series of decisions, um, as is wine tasting. I mean, there's just so much that goes into it, which grapes are the plant, what's the orientation, you know, southeast exposure, which barrels, how long are we gonna let them hang on the vines and so on. It is a, like a multitude of decisions. Um, I just see so much in that. But you also have a wonderful, you were kind of getting to it there, but you have a wonderful phrase that says, stay in the work like slow down, absorb it. I mean, it's it's what I teach my online wine and food pairing students. You know, the difference between tasting and drinking is spitting and thinking, like mm. stay with it. Like think about what you're experiencing, what you're tasting. It is subjective, but I think you can put some analysis to it. What do you mean by stay in in the work or in the art was in your the phrase? Work. Yeah, like, stay in the work. in the work. No, that's exactly it, yeah. Well, I mean, to back up a bit, I think when I was training as a sommelier for the journey that became Cork Dork. Um, you know, I was doing a lot of blind tasting. And when you're blind tasting, you, know, you have this glass of wine and you have to figure out what grape it was made with, where in the world it was made, when it was made. Um, and you really have to do that based solely on that thing in front of you. Um, and, you know, I think that process for me was really a lesson in staying true to your own felt experience of something. Like all, there's so much that's designed to play to our sensory biases, but when you're blind tasting, when you're like mano a mano with that glass of wine, you have to dismiss things like, you know, price or that little voice in your head that's like, don't miss, you know, it's Chard could it be Chardonnay? You always miss Chardonnay. Like all that stuff is not helpful. Um, and what was really off-putting and surprising to me in, as I embarked on this journey into the art world was, it couldn't have been more different. Like the philosophy on bonding with an artwork couldn't have been more opposite to that. This journey for me into the art world was really about developing what artists call visual literacy. It's about developing mm -hmm. an eye. For me, it was about, you know, how could I not just stare in an artwork's direction, but really see it, have a conversation with it. And as I was trying to develop my eye, I realized that so many of these art experts spent surprisingly little time discussing the merits of the artworks themselves. And <laughs> instead they asked questions like, where did the artist go to school? You know, who else owns the work? What gallery has shown it? Who are they sleeping with? All of that information in the art world is referred to as context. Context is like the web of names around an artist, a sort of social cachet. And so it felt, like I said, this, this real kind of culture shock for me. I felt like the wine world had, had encouraged me to, again, really stay present in that experience and dismiss all those things that are designed to play to our biases. Whereas the art was like, no, 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 what you are experiencing, you know, person to person with an artwork isn't so important compared to context. Um, you know, and context uh, really seemed to shape art connoisseur's opinion of the work even more than the thing itself. Um, as one mm. dealer told me, he was like, if you don't know the context, you can't understand what the fuck you're looking at. And so I think that- <laughs> To put it technically, yes. yes. And I think, and, and I will say that that emphasis on context didn't sit well with me. I think it felt mm. like um, I was being encouraged to outsource my eye to the hive mind. Mm. And it mm -hmm. also felt like one more way to kind of exclude people from the art world because I think these connoisseurs become so much more important if we're told that we need years of going to art fairs, 
uh, you know, vast familiarity with artists' biographies and advanced degree and so on and so forth to commune with the painting. Well, it's similar to in wine in that some buyers rely on scores or the latest prices at auctions, right. and that's how they stock their sellers, rather right. than, what do I actually like to drink? Totally, and so I think stay in the work for me was, was kind of advice that I arrived at as I started working at other galleries, um, getting deeper into the world, spending more time with artists. Um, and I think that you know, artists do have this ability to stay in the work, and I think one advice that I got um, from an artist that I found very helpful, helpful and yet kind of obviously simple, was she told me to, when you see an artwork, just try and notice five things about it. Um, and those don't have to be grandiose. It does not have to be, you know, this is a meditation on social hierarchies and class relations in the years following the French Revolution. It could just be like, this pink makes me want to lick it, or like, this <laughs> hand will not let me look away. And I guess if I could try and extrapolate maybe some similarities with, with wine tasting, um, is that it's just, it's noticing, but it's also kind of putting language on that experience. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that noticing those five things is a, is a pathway into the piece, much in the way that I think part of that process of noticing means, like I said before, paying attention to the artist's decisions. Um, and yeah, I think mm -hmm. that perhaps similarly with, with blind tasting, uh, a, a real breakthrough I had in that case was just learning to put names on smells. You know, we, we, we yes. smell a lot of odors, but most of us do not have a lot of experience or comfort actually putting language on those smells. And that's absolutely crucial, as you know, for wine tasting. Absolutely. Absolutely. To be able to discuss it, to, to name something is to, well, not have power over it, but at least to, to have be able familiarity to... familiarity with it. A familiarity. And someone said, I can't remember, but um, the the extent of my language is the extent of my understanding of the world or something. The limits yeah. of my language limits my world. I forget what it was, but I do believe that, you know, words have power and naming things and so on. But do, but I'm, there's also, of course, geek speak in both worlds, the, you call it the international art speak, and then there's wine geek speak. And the strategic snobbery, as you um, describe, I love that, for keeping people in and out with these code words. Do you think, though, that, that that language, once we start describing things, can be also very reductive? So I will say, as, as, yeah, art speak is, um, I think, part of an arsenal of tools that I began to realize was part of, like I said, the strategic snobbery, or sort of these very deliberate barriers to entry that existed to keep out the quote-unquote Joe Schmoes, which was uh, one gallerist's term for general public. And yeah. so a, a bit like Cork Dark, I mean, I, Cork Dark really convinced me in the, the value of learning by doing. And so um, I, just to give readers context or listeners context, um, as part of my journey into the art world, I was really determined to get inside and get in the middle of the action and actually go and work in the art world. And so that kicked off this five-year journey that involved me you know, selling art at galleries, working in artist studios, guarding museums, museum wings as a security guard, embedding with collectors and curators, all of part of this journey to understand like why does art matter and how do we engage with it more deeply. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of deliberate barriers to entry, at the outset I was really just surprised by how hard it was to get access. Like people did not want to talk to me. They did not respond by emails. You know, they uh, gave me threats, warnings. They were like, you know, do not oh. follow through on this plan if you want to keep living in New York City. Um, That's rather dire. Yeah, and, then, and then once I got further in and actually started working at a, as a gallery and an assistant, I began to understand that, yes, the language is sort of one of these techniques um, and one of these constructions, I guess I would say, um, that exists to sort of distinguish you as someone that does or does not get it. I think, obviously, I, I write about tasting notes in Cork Dork. I was very interested in the whole, as a writer, especially in the whole language around wine. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm a bit more forgiving, I think, of, well, I have my own issues with tasting notes. I think a lot of tasting notes have uh, sort of spiraled out into the universe to be uh, what I would generously call sort of poetry and what I would ungenerously call bullshit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet, I think that there there was a period of time um, in wine where there was an effort to rein that in. And so a lot of 
really the origins of the tasting notes that we use to describe wine was an effort to actually um, bring that language back down to earth and encourage us to use a shared vocabulary where we would talk about wines not in terms of being masculine or feminine or holding to the blood of their class, but instead, you know, smelling like, you know, white flowers, smelling like orange peel, apple, I mean, things that any of us could find in a supermarket and uh, sort of train ourselves on. Um, and so I think that, I think that there's, some of that language can become ridiculous, but I, I think that there's something admirable about the spirit of like, how do we come up with a shared vocabulary? How do we come up with the same, with a shared alphabet? And so- Excellent point. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I think art speak bothers me because I think um, it, it, it you know, exists not for clear communication. <laughs> like, mm. there's a study of press releases in the art world that found that the words spatial and non-spatial get used interchangeably. Um, if you're not familiar with art speak, it's basically this idea that the bigger the word, the better, um, the longer the sentence, the better. I mean, these days, to sound like you know something about art, the trick is basically to sound like a French professor who's been the victim of a terrible translation job. <laughs> and so, you know... Oh, like, and you, I, I must share with you your own sentence that... Um... Oh, I'll get it wrong if I don't can't find it in my notes. But one of my favorite things that you said was people in the art world sound like they were forced they to They were trapped in dictionaries. Dictionaries being forced to chew their way out. Yeah. I love that. Oh, oh my god, that is so good. And <laughs> yeah. so evocative. You know, I was told when I was working out, I was like, you don't say a work is sold, it's placed. You know, it's not an <laughs> online viewing I mean, it's not a website, it's an online viewing room. Um, and what are indexical markings? Yeah, indexical marks of the artist's body. Yes, yeah, it would be finger painting to the rest finger of us. Finger painting. Yeah. Um, so, That's you know, I think, I think that there's certainly times where there, there's, I think, an overly complex terminology in the wine world. And yet, I think there are times where there's actually, I forgive it at times because I think the specificity of language allows us to be sure that we are talking about the same things. Like, you know, the idea of describing like the rotundone smells of a wine. I think as long as you're using it in a kind of accurate way, as opposed to just what trying to What is even that? Fancy. What, what is rot What <laughs> is that? So rotundo, you know, is, I think, as I understand, like the the, 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 the the chemical notes, the, um, oh. the compound that exists in black pepper, for example, but can also exist in Syrah grapes. Um, wow. And so there's a certain logic for saying, um, you know, sort of helps explain why we describe black pepper. Syrahs is often smelling like black pepper because they can actually have like a similar chemical compound as right. black pepper. Um, wow, it reminds me of petrichor, that smell right before a rainstorm. Like yes, it's, some of I these love. are so... Although petrichor yeah. is, yes, not less scientific, but but it's so evocative. beautiful. I love it. I was thinking about this morning when I walked out after a rainstorm and I was like, oh, love it. Not, what's better than petrichor, my friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the air war. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, go back to what you were saying about the art speak, um, and you're, it, you find it, um, yeah, I think it's, it's more exclusionary. I do. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I was funny. I was doing a radio interview, and someone actually called in and mounted a defense of art speak, which I'd never heard before. And they're like, every really? field, ha you know, has their own vocabulary. True. And I think, Law, yes, doctors. Yes, yeah. But do we really think that, like, legalese is doing the world any good? And doctors, I would excuse, because I was like, you know, I want my physician to be very specific about the organ that they are removing, right? Or like, yes. I'm, I'm really- It's spatially that. around your Yeah, spine. like I think you need some technical terms to be sure that it's, you know, we're very clear on like what exactly is going on, what we're diagnosing. But, but art speak, I mean, I think that um, it feels alienating. I, I find it alienating at least. I mean, I find that oftentimes, you know, I ended up, as I said, working as a security guard at an art museum and um, I spent a lot of time reading the wall text, the sort of um, you know <laughs> paragraph long explanation that exists um, you know next to a lot of uh, artworks, and you know I felt like I was the world's hardest reading comprehension exam. I spent hours reading some of these labels, and I still don't know what they said. Um, huh. And and I think that part of that also led to me kind of disowning them as a tool that was necessary for looking at art. I mean, I used to go to galleries and museums and I felt like it was downright rude when they didn't have a wall label for each work. I was like, how am I supposed to know what I'm looking at unless you explain it to me using words? 
And as I was began to work as a guard, I actually got to the point where I was standing in front of the wall labels so people couldn't read them. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was that asshole. Um, because I felt like uh, they limited people's interpretations. You know, I think people could come at pieces that were very confusing and, and to me very confusing and very ungenerous, as art critics would say. Um, and even though they didn't know the artist or hadn't seen the piece before, would, if they let themselves, would have these incredible journeys with the work. I loved standing with visitors and challenging them. I was like, what do you see in this piece? And we would travel the world and we travel through space and time um, standing in front of these pieces when they let themselves go to those places. And I think wall text, yeah, I think is, is not often un, need, written in a language that's needlessly dense, um, but can also suggest there's sort of one right answer to looking at an artwork, which is certainly not the case. That's true, and there is some parallel there with blind tasting and not being influenced by the label. And then by extension, you know the price or the producer or whatever, just experiencing the wine for what it is and what it means to you. Absolutely, perhaps. absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this too. I mean, I, I have a very vivid memory of being at a, a blind tasting um, with a bunch of Psalms. And I remember one of them was like, I just, I think it's Zinfandel, but I hate Zinfandel and I like this <laughs> wine, you know? So, and, I, and, and afterwards when she learned it was actually Zinfandel, she was like, wow, like I, I might, actually to put the Zinfandel like on the menu or on my list, right? And I just think that that was, um, for me, like a, just a moment that really stuck with me about the value of blind tasting in mm -hmm. encouraging us to... Lift our filters, yeah, as lift you our, say, about art as exactly, well. Exactly. Get away from reductionism and all the complacency, as you say. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, yeah, I loved all the insights about art. I kept, of course, putting them back onto wine. But you say there's a suspicion in the art world of something that's pretty, um, does that remind you at all of uh, the sort of pendulum swing away from sort of, I don't know, pretty wines to the funky, foxy, sometimes flawed characters of, of natural wine as being a virtue or or even, you know, that barnyard smell that can come from Brettanomyces in Burgundy Pinot Noir? Yeah, so I think that, I think that's a really interesting question to ask and an interesting parallel. I mean, I will say that I think that um, the art world is suspicious of beauty, and it's huh. not just the art world. Um, I think that a lot of sort of polite society, a lot of um, you know, um, you know, sort of like yeah, I, I just think that that it, it goes beyond. I think a lot of polite society has a real suspicion of beauty because it's too easy. Well, I think too there's accessible? a sense that it's passe, that it is. Uh corrupted, okay. it's corrupting, um, yeah, that, that it's, you know, sort of like falling for its charms is somehow the sign of um, moral weakness. And, hmm. and I think, is it because it's easy? I mean, I think the origins of this suspicion of beauty started about a century ago, um, you know, after sort of the horrors of World War I, there was a sense that, you know, embracing beauty was frivolous. Like the world was too messed up. There were these bigger problems we had to deal with and, and beauty was just um, sort of too frivolous of a concern um, for this crazy, disturbed moment um, that, you know, and, and that art kind of sh should be, and other things should really be more philosophical um, and sort of, sorry, my mom's dog is vomiting on the floor. Okay. Um, speaking of <laughs> ugliness and beauty, <laughs> yeah, that'd um, be embraced by the. <laughs> um, but but no, I think and I, and so I think that what I will say is that I, I was very clear to me from the get go that that there was I think within circles of the art world this tendency to treat enemy beauty as the sworn enemy, and what I found as I got further in was that I think beauty is not optional. I think beauty is absolutely essential, and I think beauty. With art, we can begin to see beauty in so many more places than we did before. Um, like where? Well, so as you as you alluded to before, I mean, I think I sort of had these these pair of, of breakthroughs. I think art I'd always saw as also something kind of a luxury. I mean, it can't like you know house you, feed you, or be used to kill predators. And I think with art, we you know, we hear so much about the sort of rarefied activities, these big prices, these big names, um, and and by the as I got further in, I began to realize, like, I, th I understand now why art 
artists and scientists argue is a fundamental part of our humanity. And as you said before, um, I, I began to understand the ways that art plays this absolutely crucial function of helping us fight the reducing tendencies of our minds. And I am going to bring it back to beauty, but just to, just to explain that idea for a second, um, you know, when we look at the world, we do not see it like video cameras, right? We do not dispassionately, accurately record the scenes around us. Um, our brains are really these trash compactors. Um, we evolved, you know, to sort of oversimplify the world because we need to be able to see like a lion moving um, in the bush to come out and get us. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that hasn't really changed. Um, and so as we look out on the world, we have these filters of expectations that descend to sort of preemptively organize, sort, prioritize, dismiss all the raw data coming in even before we get the full picture. And I think what art can do, scientists and, argue, and artists argue, is help us yank off those filters of expectation. Um, a bit like dreams, right? Like they introduce a glitch. It's a glitch that is a gift, one that helps our minds jump the curb, sort of question its assumptions. I mean, vision is really a hallucination. So much of the reality that we experience is sort of our own construction and belief. And I think what art can do is help us remove those filters of expectations so we're seeing the world in a way that lets in more information, more nuance, and ultimately more beauty. And so when I say that art can help us discover beauty in places that we never did before, I, I think it can let us look with fresh eyes, with a fresh brain on the everyday. Like I loved the way that artists were able to really see art in something as sort of quotidian as like a sewage treatment plant or a motorcycle. Mm. Um, and I think what they have this ability to do is sort of look at the everyday with an art mindset, sort of look at something. I experienced this after working at the Guggenheim. I started sort of looking at everything from like a toothbrush to a hot dog cart like it was a sculpture. It was sort of with this <laughs> extra beat, this willingness to linger on why, how did it get to be this way? And so I think for me, it, it led me to really open up my idea of and definition of what beauty is. And I think beauty does not have to be the vanilla, the kind of visual equivalent of a vanilla cupcake. To me, beauty is really just something that draws us closer to it, makes us curious, makes us want to linger with it, study it, examine it, be around it. It sort of nudges us into this place where we're wondering about the world and our place in it. And so <laughs> to bring it back to wine, I mean, I think that, you know, Perhaps there's something in which, I think there's a lot of different things that bring people to funky, in some cases, fucked up wines. But I also think that perhaps what it might be is, for some people, they're discovering a beauty in them that they didn't perhaps appreciate before, but that through sustained time with wines, with tasting, they're sort of opening themselves up to finding what they consider beauty in different places. And a new taste experience. I mean, yeah. there's a whole range, as you know, with wine. So we can lift those filters, too, of from vanilla, Chardonnays, and, and Cabernets. Yeah. Um, it's a journey. I think, I think that there was an artist, Julie Curtis, that I worked for who really encouraged me to think of taste less as a destination than as uh -huh. a journey. And I think that, for me, I've always been of this mindset that, like, I had to... I had to find the the right tastes. Like I had to figure out like, you know, what was good, what was bad. And I think a lot of us perhaps, you know, share that idea, but also I think a lot of us wear our tastes as this sort of ironclad identity. It's like we are a person that likes natural wines. We are a person that only drinks California Chardonnays. We are a person who exclusively, you know, listens to country music. And I think that we oftentimes are very loath to question our tastes, to challenge our tastes. And I think I'm, I'm so grateful um, to Julie and to the other artists I met for really pushing me on that, for, for helping me understand that with new tastes comes a new self and that taste, again, should be a journey. It should be an adventure. And part of developing our eye and, and being able to engage more deeply with art and really anything means exposing ourselves to different things, things we don't know, things we think we might not like, um, things that are just unfamiliar and weird to us. And I think that's exciting and yeah. can be destabilizing, but ultimately I think very rewarding. 
Absolutely. And, you know, you, you even, uh, the, the whole thing about getting it right or wrong, like, you know, being, you know, when it comes to blind tasting, some people, the mark of a good taster is, did they guess the label correctly? And to me, that's beside the point for most tasters, maybe in a master of wine or master sommelier exam, getting it right is extra points. But I, I, I don't think so much in life, <laughs> getting it right is it as in or as opposed to getting it more to be more expansive yeah. or just getting more yeah. of it <laughs> more of it <laughs> yeah especially the good wine um so you know you note in get the picture that um there are a lot of uh entrenched often self-appointed gatekeepers um that's very much like the wine world you have uh not only new voices old guard but new world old world or countries are um, slotted into those definitions. Um, do you think the, the art world or the wine world is better? One of them is better at succeeding at bringing in new voices or the rebel alliance, as you call them, um, to the fore? Or do they both have their own issues, but they're different? Uh, I think they both have work to do. Um, you know, I think that part of the reason that I think, I think what I hoped with both of these books, with Cork Dork and with Get the Picture, is that, um, you know, I, I hoped that they were the sort of book that, like, someone who had spent years collecting art or working at a museum or someone who had, um, you know, spent a lifetime tasting Burgundy could read and discover something new, but also someone who'd never stepped foot in a gallery or someone who'd never bought a bottle of wine could read them and be compelled to take that, to make art or wine a part of their lives. I think you've achieved that goal with oh, both books. Thank you. I really Absolutely. hope so. I mean, I hope that doesn't sound you know overly ambitious. But you know, why, why no, do something it unless it's ambitious? And so, I, I think that there's a lot of people um, who are trying to do that in their own and different ways. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, I think that, like you know, here in New York, I, I ended up working. Um, for Paul Greco, who runs Terroir, and, and I just mm, I love. He's a Canadian, by the yeah, way. Yes, he is, and and I. You know, he was someone who I think, like, I had never read a wine list that made me laugh until I stepped foot in terroir. And so, and I think he's done really fascinating wine classes and just just things that, that mix things up. And, and I like the way that um, it's it feels like an interesting kind of experimental approach. New like, approach. Yeah. yeah. What made you laugh? The conversation. <laughs> what, made, what didn't? I mean, you know, if you've ever seen his wine list, like it's this combination of like screeds and manifestos. Like there's a whole uh. section where he compared like each like cru classe or like, I don't know, like each of the first growths of Bordeaux to like a different wrapper or something. It was just huh. these insane meditations on life and wine and um and the guy's just, you know, a mad genius. And and I think, you know, likewise, there's so many people in the art world looking to bring art um, beyond the sort of intimidating format of the white cube. I mean, there's, there's a gallery called Good Naked that um, will do art shows in the park and hang work, you know, on trees on a nice day. Um, so I, I think it's really exciting to see that there are um, a lot of people who want to move beyond that gatekeeping. Um, and, and also, you know, I think, I think it's important. To me, I always got really frustrated, I think, with art and with wine. People were always like, oh, it's like there's no rules. Like, you can engage with it any way you want. Mm. And as someone who really felt totally adrift in being able to connect with either what art or wine, I found that advice really frustrating. because so I was like, I just don't mm. even know where to start. I have nothing to hold on to. I feel like I'm just slipping off of both of these things. And as a result, I'm just not engaging. And so I do think that um, it is important to give people the tools to think for themselves, to really be able to engage with art or with wine on their own terms. I mean, I, and I think with wine, I think there's oftentimes too much telling people what to taste instead of mm -hmm. teaching them how to taste. Taste, um, yes. And I think the art world is, is can be guilty of something similar, but um, I do think that ultimately everything you need to have a meaningful experience of art is right in front of you. Um, and that's right. not to say that we can't each work a little harder to exercise our eye, um, but it's not impossible to do so, and you don't need to spend a lot of money. You just need 
um, a little time and certainly the inclination and, and eagerness to do so. Yeah, to expose yourself and, as you say, stay in the work. And I agree with you, you know, it's, I think, unhelpful to beginners, especially to, to try to demystify or democratize wine to the extent that you say anything goes. Put ketchup on your ice cream and drink it with a Cabernet. Like, there's a reason some guidelines exist and, you know, a reason why I'm still teaching courses on this subject. Um, it's, it's kind of knowing what the rules have been so you know how to bend and break them to your own pleasure, mm, I think. Yeah. So, um, but uh, you also say, you also have a great, I just, some of your phrases are just as, as Kirk, was a Kirkus Review said, you can make dust sparkle. Like, oh my <laughs> God, what, what a quote. I, I love um, it. Thank you. I was excited. Well deserved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you say, um, they, well, um, both worlds have their own st strong social grapevines. Of course, you were t saying how they're in the art world, they're talking about everything around the artwork more so than the art itself. But you have a phrase that says, gossip for art people is like echolocation for bats. You sent out signals of what you thought was greater derivative or phony and then oriented yourself based on what came back. Um, do you think the <laughs> the social grapevine is... is um, helpful or is it just another exclusionary tool in the art or wine worlds? Yeah, well, I think that there's, um, there's definitely a lot of gossip in, in both worlds. Um, uh, I mean, you know, nothing gets people talking like a bottle of wine, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, one thing that, um, as you're asking that, I, I realize it is similar about both is that there is the gossip, which is not always great. On the other hand, I do think that you have a strong culture of sort of mentorship. I mean, there is this idea mm. of um, a lot, for better or for worse, and I think often for worse, um, the rules of the trade are not written down, right? And it's really True. something that you learn through apprenticeship. You know, it's something you learn um, by doing a stage in a restaurant, something you learn by um, finding a more experienced psalm to be your mentor or weaseling your way, as I did, into um, tasting groups with aspiring master sommeliers. Um, in the art world, it can mean like working as a studio assistant to an artist. It can mean doing studio visits with other artists or just kind of being in the mix so that you glean these uh, sort of really crucial life lessons around how do you get a gallery? Um, like, what should a contract say? Should you have a contract? And so I think that, um, I will say that I, I found it disheartening to learn that the sort of vow of silence that, that exists often in the art world extended not just to journalists like myself, but also to artists that were in it. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, as I said before, I had a lot of trouble getting access into the art world. And, and I, I began to think that there is a way in which the art world views secrecy as key to its survival. Part of it is that, you know, there are things that would pass for absurd, illicit, illegal in other realms. So um, if you haven't taken this mafia-like vow of, of silence, you're viewed as a risk. Um, some of it is also, I think, that that withholding of information is a way to build mystique, to concentrate power in the hands of gatekeepers. Um, but, but as I was saying, I, you know, when I spoke to artists, I was disheartened to find that these people who had so much more at stake than I did, who had years more in this field, um, really were still befuddled on how to make a career in it. I mean, even basic things like how do you get a gallery to show your work, right? Were things that people had spent a dozen years in New York City trying to figure out. And so um, I do wish that some of these things were clear and more codified. Um, on the other hand, like I said, I think um, these are both worlds where, you know, the good actors within them are very willing to to be mentors, um, to yes, be sources of true. support and guidance. And so I think that's the good side of the talking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and you also observe in the art world that people socialize and sometimes even live where they work, uh, which is also the case with wine. I mean, talk about winemaker dinners at night and just the whole thing is very campish. Um, do you think that creates a culture also of, of drinking your own Kool-Aid and not experiencing life more broadly for those who create art and wine? Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, it could perhaps, but I think it's it's tough to um, it, it is tough to criticize because I think that 
it is so part and parcel to also sort of getting ahead in these different worlds. Um, True. And I think that that also can create opportunities, but I think it's also can be unfair. I mean, I think it's a lot to ask of artists. Like, I, I work for a dealer whose um, advice to artists who are trying to get galleries to show their work in New York City was basically like, you've got to go to openings all the time. Like, be at openings, make it your job to go to openings. Like, you've got to be underfoot. You've got to make friends with artists. You've got to make friends with the people running the galleries. Um, and I think that that is, on the one hand, not necessarily bad advice, but also, I think, we have to recognize difficult for many people. I mean, if you are, um, I will say that my my journey through the art world was really focused on emerging up and coming artists. You know, to me, that is the highest stakes and least covered part of the world. It's this this place where we can see the bloody business of art history being made. Um, and I really wanted to see, like, how does a work of art go from being this germ of an idea in someone's studio to this cultural icon that we obsess over in the halls of museums. Um, I feel like all the decisions that shape that work are also decisions that shape us, right? Our idea of what art is, who makes it, why we should engage with it. Um, and so in the process of focusing on those up and coming artists, you know, I got to know a lot of people who, you know, they're working one, two, three jobs so that they can go home and in the dregs of the day do the work they want to do, which is their artwork, um, <laughs> you know, and so, forget having a family or kids. I mean, that's, it's hard to be, spend all of your time bopping around openings and networking um, if you also want to be baking art or, you know, God forbid, like, you know, having a family. <laughs> so I guess, I guess it's just, it's, um, I, I guess, you know, it's all to say that, um, you know, I think that to some extent the way that these industries are designed necessitates that, like, business is pleasure and pleasure is business and all that. But yeah, I don't know that it's always necessarily for the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, at least the restaurant world can be hard on family life, given the hours and the totally. Yeah. Not just the time you work, but the length of time you have to work like art. Yeah. Um, um, so well, this is just so interesting, but, um, you suggest spending less time with the masterpieces, I believe, to just correct me anytime I misquote, um, and more time with less discovered pieces, say, in someone's home. Um, I guess we kind of covered that uh, in that. I, my question would be, don't we have to train first on the classes, then branch out? But I guess you're you're more nuanced than that in the book in terms of It's an interesting question. Respond. I mean, certainly with blind tasting, I felt like it was really helpful to, like, start with the noble grapes, right? And and to, um, you know, someone had given me the advice of like, you know, start with the noble grapes and then, you know, Sauvignon Blanc. If you're trying to figure out what Sauvignon Blanc tastes like, drink only Sauvignon Blanc for like a week or a month, right? And, and try and figure out its permutations as it moves from France to New Zealand to California. Um, and I did find that really helpful. And I think that for me, um, sort of getting a handle on, being able to sort of say, because look, the art, the, the wine world is so vast, right? If you're, I mean, to try and taste your way through the grapes of Italy alone could take you a lifetime, right? And so I think I found True. it helpful to sort of say, all right, let's start with um, this handful of uh, very frequently used grapes, and like you know, then go on these these sort of field trips to figure out, like again, how does the, the character of a Chardonnay change as it moves around the world? I did find that helpful, and I will say that like. You know, I, wine is still a huge part of my life, but I do a bit less blind tasting than I did before. Um, and I'm now, I think, in that phase of uh, having had that foundation, going off on more adventurous excursions to try, like, you know, the Grillos of Sicily or the Ribola Jalas of Slovenia. You know, like, I think that sure. um, I feel like I am sort of have that, that foundation to now explore a little bit more. And I think with art, you know, you're right. I mean, I, I've encouraged people to spend a bit less time with the quote unquote masterpieces in museums and more time seeking out art by emerging artists, by artists that they don't know, that they've never heard of. Um, you know, going to, like you said, galleries in basements, going to art schools, just going off the beaten track a bit. And I do think, um, I suggest that because I think that is really crucial to developing 
our eye. Um, and I think that, you know, context is, of course, you know, for me, I was on this journey to sort of understand, like I said, why does art matter and how do we engage with it more deeply? And I hope that people will find a number of different answers to those questions in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, there were certain paths and answers that resonated more than others. And, you know, I do think perhaps informed by my experience with wine, I do think that there's something to be said for people not outsourcing their taste to context and for instead really developing their own eye. And I think part of developing it, as I said before, is to expose yourself to, to different things, to things you don't know. Um, and my hope is that if each of us do a little bit more to work that muscle, to develop our eye, that we could you know, maybe support a greater variety of artists, of art forms, of, of forms of expression. I think there's this myth in the art world that genius is in short supply. There's sort of this idea that you hear in a lot of galleries. Um, it's a sort of the myth of artificial scarcity. You know, like you go to galleries, especially in art fairs, and it's like, hurry, like this offer won't last long, like act now, right? And there's this sort of sense, like, you know, there's a limited number of really great artists in the world. And, and just in my experience, I don't buy that. And so um, I just, I, I think it would be amazing if, uh, if each of us could exercise our eye and, and, like I said, really engage with it on our own terms and in the process um, allow more artists and more different forms of expression to, to really blossom and flourish. I love that idea. It's almost like we become a mini Medici, like sponsoring a little local yes, artist or whatever. Which you can do, which you can do. And I think, you know, like, I, I think that like with art, I think, Sorry, with art and with wine, I think price is not necessarily an indicator of quality. <laughs> and, yeah. and just for people who may, like me, have thought, well, like you can't buy real you know, original artwork without taking out a mortgage, um, which is what I used to think, you can buy art for $120. You can buy it for $25. You can buy it for, you know, there's just, it's a whole range out there. And I think that's um, really exciting. And I think at those prices, you can sort of afford to, take a risk um, mm -hmm. and at the same time like you're supporting someone um, you're supporting a different way of seeing the world and that's huge that's great I love that I love that um, both worlds are as you say playgrounds of the rich that invite polite corruption love that we've heard of fake bottles of wine being sold at auction for hundreds of thousands of dollars what's the most unusual or intriguing fake or con that's been played out in the wine or in the uh, art world Oh my gosh, there's so many. I actually <laughs> just wrote um, a feature story for the Atlantic magazine about a particular case of art forgery that I found very fascinating. Hmm. And it was basically um, a story about this trove of supposed paintings by Jean-Michel Basquiat, a um, you know, very famous artist who passed away. Um, his paintings can sell for like you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so these these pieces were discovered, they got the thumbs up from various experts, they were valued at you know, millions of dollars, um, and they went and had a splashy show at an art museum, and then they were confiscated by the FBI on the grounds that they were forgeries. Wow. And so the piece sort of looks at this particular case, but it also asks this sort of broader question of why is it still so hard to tell real artwork from fake, fake artwork, and also does it matter? Um, and I do think that, um, you know, it is interesting to note that with art, I mean, the idea of a forgery is actually a relatively recent invention. We haven't always cared what was original and what was a forgery or what was a fake. Um, and there is a philosopher who's also an artist who actually makes the case that forgeries are great artworks unto themselves. I mean, they can, not only can they in many cases sort of give us this experience of beauty, you know, can they, you know, in many cases, like, we, there's so many examples of throughout history of um, artworks that have been sort of real one day, fake the next, and then real again the day after that. And, you know, really authenticity, which we like to think of as cut and dry, in the art world has been shown over time to be much more fluid than we may be comfortable with. Um, and so this philosopher sort of proposed, like, okay, so not only can these forgeries really move us in the way that artworks can, but perhaps they themselves are great artworks in the sense that they make us 
question our assumptions. Um, they make mm. us look differently, um, you know, at our way of looking at the world. They, um, you know, kind of make us uncomfortable. And so those are all things that he would argue that a great artwork can do. Um, I, I found that a really intriguing argument. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. And how did they figure out they were fakes? So they, um, it's complicated, but basically there's always, you know, issues with provenance, chain of custody, um, you know, I think well, interestingly, unlike wine, um, where, you know, once you open the bottle of wine, you've just got to drink it on the spot, right? It's, you know, um, there's this issue of connoisseurship with art where it's like different experts can look at the same artwork and sort of rule on what they view to be its authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there are many connoisseurs that, that disagreed with the authenticity of these, of these particular supposed Boscat paintings. Um, but what should have been the final nail in the coffin came when um, the person who had originally sold them admitted to forging most of the works. Um, uh. The owners of these works did not take that to be the final nail in the coffin. And so the pieces about the continued dispute and sort of their argument that these might actually still be real. Um, but <laughs> yes, if you want to learn more, you can, you can read the piece and, and try and find pictures of the artworks themselves. Huh, in the Atlantic. Excellent. What, um, what do you wish the art world would teach the wine world and vice versa? Ooh. I mean, hmm, I think that, you know, I wish for both of these worlds, like I wish that they would teach each other, but also the world at large. Um, I think just how, how essential these things are to our lives. I mean, I think that I encounter you know, people in the art world who are incredibly dismissive of wine. You know, they felt like it was this kind of overly hedonistic um, experience that, you know, couldn't really give you a profound experience of something. And, and well, that's so, because the, the wine traditionally at gallery art openings is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. Second only to cheap weddings. I mean, come on, people. But anyway, yes, they yeah. dismissed it without giving it a chance the way they... Yeah. yeah, and I think, art. and I think that um, you know, I think that you know, likewise, I think that art, as I said before, I think it, it strikes many people as being totally optional or even irrelevant. And um, like, I wish that the wine world, I wish the world at large, really understood the way that spending time with art can not only change us as art viewers, but also change us as human beings. Um, and I think for, for both books, like, um, you know, I, like I've had people who are like, oh, I'm not going to read Cork Door because I don't drink wine. And, mm -hmm. and I'm always like, oh, it's, it's, yes, it's about wine, but it's also really about these forgotten senses of taste and smell and experiencing the world in a different way and experiencing more of the world. And I think people that do read the book, I, I hope, like, see that and understand that. I've had people say that. They're like, it's, you know, I don't drink wine, but it doesn't matter. Like, I still you know, learned exactly. a lot. Um, and, and about human nature. I mean, that's deeply right. embedded into both <laughs> yeah. books. And I know for, for my latest book, Wine Witch on Fire, my most meaningful reviews have come from teetotalers mm. who, like, do not drink. And I take it as the highest form of praise. Yeah, I but, love that. You know? I totally yeah, but agree. But anyway, your books are definitely, um, it doesn't matter if you if you uh, have never drink, drank a drop of wine in your life. <laughs> you should still read Cork Dork and get thanks. the picture. Thanks, yeah. thanks. Yeah, but um, yeah. it would be really fun. I think, you know, there was less overlap in the worlds than I had expected. I think, you know, yes, like there are a lot of, these worlds both do attract people with, considerable amounts of money. They, you know, there's a big collecting culture in both, which requires having, um, you know, lots of zeros in your bank account. Um, and, um, you know, I do think that, and yet, like, I was surprised that there, there just wasn't more connection and conversation. And um, I think it'd be really fun if we threw all these people together in a room more often, and, and not, just, not just with the free wine and openings, which sadly, I will add, um, doesn't happen as, as much as I had thought. You know, there's not, huh. there's definitely, um, 
it definitely is in, in many openings, but more often it's like there's a big trash can with ice and beer. So <laughs> oh, that's very sad. Very sad. Um, and you mentioned you learn by doing, and I, I do admire your approach very much, as has been reflected in the reviews of Get the Picture, like Tom Wolfe, George Plimpton, Joan Didion, and even I think Michael Pollan, who traces you know the journey of meat back to the original cattle. Um, I do think I agree. Uh, it often yields deeper, richer insights. But do you think you can? Do you think that you might? be changing the narrative by being in the middle of it versus leaving it undisturbed, so to speak, by just observing it? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, probably, certainly, um, I think that there is, um, you know, merits to so many different approaches. And I'm so glad that different writers take different approaches. And, um, you know, some people, you know, just do interviews or, or there's obviously many historical texts. I just found, especially after Cork Dork, that I was really convinced in the value of getting in the middle of the action, of learning by doing. I mean, it's one thing for an art dealer to give you the polite answer to how they sell a painting, and quite another, as I've now experienced, to you know, sell thousands of dollars worth of art from the backseat of an art Uber during Art Basel Miami while people are doing cocaine around you. Um, <laughs> and I think that, um, you know, yeah, certainly it's, you know, I'm there and, and people know um, that I'm a writer, so of course that changes things, but, um, you know, nonetheless, I think that, uh, I think over time, I think it still just offers for a richness and a depth of understanding that I really value as a human being <laughs> and, and as a writer. And how did you get them to let their guard down, or did they? Like, because they did know you're, you're a, a writer or journalist. Um, going into their world. Yeah, which makes it that much more surprising that some people did and said some of the things that they did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let people read the book to figure out what I mean by that. But, um, yeah, yeah. but I think that, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's hard to know. I mean, of course, you know, people I'm sure would be different in some sort. But I, but I also think that, um, you know, I was lucky enough to find people who were really, excited about having me around about the sort of collaboration that that was and so it isn't something that I worry about too much but I, but I think that you know like I worked for um, a, a pair of gallerists you know who they put that they just wanted to see more people love art they wanted to bring more people into this world um, and so they were excited to pull back the curtain to show what goes on and how to do it and, and let me get in there and sell art with them, write press releases, spackle walls. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, and then you had people who, you know, were very, who told me, uh, there was one dealer who I worked for who t pulled me aside one afternoon to tell me, you're not the coolest cat in the art world, so <laughs> having you around, it's just like lowering my coolness. Um, so, you know, oh, I got advice to, you know, kind of change my wardrobe, tone down my enthusiasm, rethink some of the ways I communicated, all of that. And again, you have some great phrases like a cactus chasing a balloon or something and a chihuahua. Was it a chihuahua enthusiasm or something? <laughs> so fun, your language. Um, oh, this time has gone by. Let's go to a lightning round, just quick answers, whatever comes to mind, Bianca. Uh, which wines would you pair with these artworks? Jackson Pollock an abstract painting by Jackson Pollock? Oh, so, okay. Well, uh, so Jackson Pollock was um, a notorious alcoholic who died mm -hmm. in an alcohol, uh, anyway, it was during a drunk driving accident. So I feel like in oh. this case, I would probably drink very strong coffee. Um, but, but, like, answer. Um, but I think with, you know, g generally for like that kind of abstract expressionist artwork, like, I don't know, like champagne, like if I had to, mm. like I just feel like there's some like effervescence to like that work that I think um, some sort of like a sparkling wine would be, mm, like you feel that, you look at, this, at the zhuzh and then you feel it from the inside as well. I love that. Edgar Degas, Little Dancer of 14 Years, the sculpture. Mm, yes, yeah, so um, again, I feel like, I wish she was 21 so she could drink, but, um, <laughs> but I feel like for like Degas in general and sort of like the whole series of like ballerinas, it would have to be something like extremely classically and obviously French. So like, and I think crisp, like something about the work to me is just like, there's always this, I don't know, like a kind of, um, 
linearity or I, something. Yeah, maybe, but it's also like a Leaks luminosity to it. And so I think yeah. like a Chablis, I'd probably say like some mm. super, you know, like first growth Chablis. Okay. And oh, people are gonna... I'm saying not first growth. Oh my God. But not July, but, you know, like, um, yeah, like a, pre- anyway, a premier crew, crew, like some, like a really nice Chablis. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And people are going to have to read the book to find out who Mandy Allfire, Allfire <laughs> is. Fantastic live performance artist, but what would you pair with one of her performances? Yeah, so, yeah, Mandy Allfire is a, was an ass influencer performance <laughs> artist. Um, who, That's great. Yeah, so also a nearly naked performance artist who sat on my face, which is how we met. Um, I mean, gosh, it's crazy. I mean, I, I have to think more like a Budweiser heavy, I'm not going to lie. Like, just like, <laughs> you know, I feel like you need, like, like, because I just, like, it, it was this opening, it was in the basement of a gallery, like, it was, it was, you know, there was wires hanging at the wall. I, I just like, you kind of like, it's more of like a beer, like you got a, a can of beer in your hand. I don't yeah, know, but. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or something, I guess, earthy. Yeah, right, right, right. It's a good question. Yeah, well, great answers. Um, if you could share a bottle of wine uh, with any person outside the wine world, living or dead, who would that be? And uh, what bottle would you open? Mm. I mean, I feel like this is every writer's answer, but like probably <gasps> Joan Didion. I mean, I would just, ah. yeah. Um, what bottle of wine? I would have to. I mean, I would be so excited to meet her and talk to her that I would probably drink, you know, I would like pull out something really special, like a, you know, vintage champagne, like a really old nice. vintage champagne. Or I would mm-hmm. try and get something really high alcohol so that she would get drunk and like stay and talk more. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, all right. Um, cool. You went in the, the art world to develop your eye and uh, into the wine world to develop your taste. I'd like to know which organ is next. Is it yeah. music, touch, <laughs> dance, fashion? Is it instead of get the picture, maybe catch a tune, listen up or move yeah, the muscle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love all of that. I don't know yet, but I think all of those worlds and topics are really, really fascinating. And why not? Um, I've, thought, I've thought about each of them in their own way. Excellent. We can't wait, yeah. Bianca. I Thanks. mean, uh, we're greedy for your work, so keep writing. I mean, it just... It's a real treat to to read you and to talk with you. Well, thank you. Well, likewise. Um, And I'm so grateful. It's a real um, honor and a pleasure. and, And your kind words mean a lot coming from you. So thank you. Thank you, Bianca. As we wrap up, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to share? I'm also going to ask how people can find you and your books online, but is there anything else you'd like to mention? I mean, look, I could stay here and talk to you for hours, so I feel like there's <laughs> a lot of things, but no, I feel like we've, you know, it's been a blast. It's been really great, and, and again, I'm awesome. really thankful. And your books, Get the Picture and Cork Dork, are available wherever books are sold online and book retailers. Um, where can we find you online? Yep, there's audiobooks, there's ebooks. Um, right. They're in different languages, uh, soon to be Get the Picture in different languages. Um, I, my website is biancabosker.com. Um, on social media, I'm B Bosker. And yeah, you're always welcome to reach out. It's bianca.bosker at me.com. Excellent, Bianca. So um, don't log off yet, but I will say uh, goodbye for now. And this has been a real treat. Cheers to you. And to you. Thank you so much. Okay.